This episode of This Agile Life has been brought to you by BrilliantAgile.com, providing agile and scrum training, consultancy, and personnel. BrilliantAgile.com. Done right, it's brilliant. Released on Sunday, December 11th, 2016, This Agile Life, episode 123, Return of the Amos King. The software industry transforms more and more every day. Agile methods are quickly replacing traditional ones. The question is, are you agile enough? This podcast is devoted to agile and lean software development. Time to welcome your agile coaches on This Agile Life. Hello everyone, I'm John Sextro, welcoming you back to another great episode of This Agile Life. In this episode, Amos King finishes up his roving reporter duties down at Agile Dev East in Orlando, Florida. In this episode, Amos sits down with David Bernstein for a nice long discussion. Amos, take it away. I'm here at Agile Dev East with uh, David Bernstein, and, and David, what what do you what do you do in your your day to day work? <laughs> what do I do? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, I'm a software developer. I've been a developer for about 30 years, which is kind of scary to say. Uh, and um, I got into the software business a long time ago, and I just loved it. You know, now most of what I do is I focus on. Agile development practices, the technical practices of extreme programming. Um, so I help teams. I help teams do test-driven development, and you know, refactoring, and emergent design, and continuous integration stuff like that. So, did you um, were you doing any of the XP practices before Kent Beck's book came out, or was that kind of your beginning into XP? Oh, that's interesting. Um, actually, I was. Like many of my colleagues doing Agile long before we had the term Agile, um, I was kind of feeling guilty about it a lot of times. Uh, because back then, you know, in the 90s, uh, when we had a big project, I couldn't hold the whole thing in my head. So I would just take a little piece of it and just do a piece of it. And I thought that, you know, it was kind of because I just didn't have a lot of space in my memory to be able to handle it. And who knew they came up with a methodology called Agile that was like break it down into little pieces and do little pieces. Uh, so, so I was doing Agile. Now I'm doing, now I'm doing Agile still, but uh, not feeling guilty about doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and have a name to describe it. Yes, yes. Other than just breaking into pieces. Um, so you also recently became an author. After a long time of writing code, now you're writing prose. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you can you tell us about uh, uh, your book? Yes, yes. Uh, I just came out with a book. Uh, came out late last year called Beyond Legacy Code: Nine Practices to Extend the Life and Value of Your Software. And it is it is is a little different than other books about legacy code. Uh, I'm a big fan of Michael Feather's book, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. He's a good man. Good man. He's an awesome man. <laughs> Sweet guy. I get to see him at, at a lot of the conferences. Nice. And, um, and I love the techniques in his book. And I do cover some of the, some other techniques as well, but not, not a lot. It's a really a different approach. Beyond Legacy Code is, is really about how to not get there in the first place. And so I talk about um, nine key practices that I think are the highest value practices of Agile. And that's not stand-up meetings and, and doing iterations. It's um, more on the technical side, although some of them are non-technical. Like practice one is um, uh, say what, why, and for whom before how. And that's really important because the way, we, the way we talk about what we need to build has a lot of impact on how we build it. Um, so... I really like that idea of before how, and, and you you talked a little bit about why you would you would say it before how. Can you can you tell everybody out there? <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So I think a lot of times when we're focusing on how to do something, developers first of all hear that that's the way management wants it, and so they build it that way. In software development, it's really important to build to build our code in a way that is not the way most people think of a process, so that it's more maintainable. You know, we want to take advantage of object-oriented programming if we're using an OO environment, and we think about things a little bit differently. This is our expertise as developers. Developers get to dive into the how, but we want to always hide it in the, from the outside world, because because when we can 
encapsulate how we do things in our code and only talk about what we do. It gives us the freedom to change it later. So this is a little bit different than my policy with humans, with other people, which is that I, I want to be in full disclosure with people. But in software, although I respect my code a lot, I think my objects are kind of should be in service to us. I guess it's not a very enlightened point of view in modern age. But, you know, once once computers become conscious, I think I could shift that view. Yeah. But in terms of the code itself, if each piece of the code understands just what it needs to do its job, then it gives an enormous amount of flexibility to change it later. And really, that's what my book is about, and that's what a lot of my work is about, is how to build software in a way that's easily changeable. Because it costs five times more after software is released to maintain and extend it that that's crazy but but it's a shocking as soon as you say it it's like well yeah uh, (laughs) i see that every day um and i I often get uh story cards that say how they they say i want i don't know i can't even think about one right now but they they tell you exactly what they want to write and and i do i tell people you as, a, as an engineer, um, you pay me way too much money to tell me how. <laughs> yes. Tell me what and why, and, and and let me use the creativeness, the artistic side, and and my experiences in, in other areas, and bring all that in and and produce a fantastic piece of software for you. Yes. Because if you're telling me how, first of all, you're doing way too much work. <laughs> yes. And then you're paying me way too much money because I can hire a brand new programmer and tell him I need a linked list and he'll hand me one. Mm-hmm. But if I tell him I need a bag full of numbers, bag is also a ter- bad term, but I, <laughs> I need a bunch of numbers and I need to be able to sort them, he might come up with something way better than, sure. than what I thought. Sure. Um, especially after he's had experiences in other areas. Yes. So, yeah. I think that, that that's fantastic. Um, but many of the technical, many of the practices that I talk about in my book are, are more technical, like writing the test first and refactoring legacy code. Yeah. Um, well, we'll just take them in, in the order that I wrote them out of your, your okay. talk. And, you want to go uh, through all nine of them? Wow. Uh, if we can, if you don't mind. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't mind. I just okay. want to make sure that it's interesting for you. Do my uh, best. It's interesting for me. Uh, <laughs> that's why I got your book yesterday, and I suggest that everybody else does, too. I oh, meant thank to you. read some of it last night, and by the time I got back to my room, I opened it up, I read about two pages, and then realized that everything was blurry <laughs> on the page, and I just needed to sleep. Yes. Uh, this is my second conference in a row, so I'm just wow. going, going, going. I understand. Um, so uh, the second one you have is build in small batches, yes. which we, we kind of touched on at the beginning there about uh, how you got into Agile, but, but we kind of explain more of what and, that yeah. means. And everybody knows this one, you know, this is really the essence of what Scrum is all about. And, you know, one of the things that I think people gravitate to immediately, and, and it's great, you know, divide and conquer, make things small because small problems are easier to solve, and then you can recompose them back up. Uh, so really, this practice is really focusing on why this is effective and why it's important. So you can leverage it more effectively. And it is an opportunity to get feedback, lots of feedback, more rapidly. And it's also an opportunity to experiment, you know, and try new things. And doing this practice along with that first practice, we can really make development a discovery process rather than sort of blindly following requirements. Sometimes we have to follow requirements because that's the way the business is structured or that's the way it makes the most sense to build something. But in if we're building something new, something that no one has ever done before, then probably we want to go through a process of discovery. And when we do that and emerge the design, we wind up with a far better result. A result that is that does more of the right thing that the customer actually wants and that does it more in the right way that's more maintainable and extendable. So when you, you can build in small batches without shipping in small batches. Oh, yeah, and, absolutely. And, and do, do you think that shipping in small batches when you can? I know that if you have, if you're, if you're building an iPhone, for instance, you, you can't just ship continuously from the very beginning. You have to get like this minimal product out before 
it's even useful. Um, and even some hardware, once it's out there, there's no upgrading it. So, um, it, out, withstanding that, do you think that shipping in small batches is also important along with it? It, it depends. When we ship, how we ship, these are business decisions. And I don't think it's really something that we developers should I mean, we can have a say in it if, if it makes sense, but it's really something that the business should decide based on maintenance contracts, based on, you know, seasonality of your of need for the product or, or other business factors. But I believe that almost universally we should build software so it's always shippable. And it's not because that we want to ship it at particular times. It's because it makes the most sense to build in that way. It gives us the most flexibility. And it is also the most straightforward way to build if we're building continuously. See, I've worked on so many waterfall projects where, you know, it's a a year-long project and nine months in we realize we're six months behind. I was always six months behind. I just (laughs) didn't realize it until three months before I had to ship. And so... I, I sometimes refer to Agile as, as telling smaller lies. And I mean it in the most positive way. You know, we can't help but lie to ourselves. And, and I think that as humans, we have to, to get out of bed in the morning. Because facing the unknown is a scary thing. Uh, so we want to make sure that what we're saying to ourselves, what we're believing, is going to empower us to do the right things. So when we get feedback, it all, also helps us get back on track. Right. I like the telling smaller lies. Um, one of our other hosts, Craig, he he often says that like agile just puts the truth in your face <laughs> because yes. you get that feedback so often it's just jamming it back at you and saying no, you were you were wrong, but yes. that's okay because you can fix it. Um, and, and he said it's just being it's starting to be more honest with yourself than you were when you did six month requirements gatherings and things like that. And I, yes. I have done both. And, yes, and I, I see. I like the smaller lies, though. I think that's fantastic because we do, I, we do yes. say, "Oh, I can do that," and then you realize, "Well, maybe not quite that, <laughs> right?" Or at least not in that time frame or whatever. I was just um, in a session from Ryan Ripley, and he was a really great speaker. And he said, "What did he say?" He said, "Scrum is not a problem solving framework; it's a problem finding framework." So I tweeted that, and it was like the most powerful tweet I've ever done. I've, I've, I keep looking at my phone, and it's like, oh, 200 more people retweeted it. Wow. I'm like, my goodness. <laughs> so it struck a nerve. But it, it did for me, too. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and we, I, I did interview Ryan, and he's been on our podcast before, uh, and, and he's a good guy. And he is. And, and can has I, some good insights. Can I also say that I love his podcast as well? Oh, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> it is a good podcast. I like listening to it. Yes, um, Agile for Humans, it's called. Yes, Agile for Humans, which we did make sure we plugged in on, okay. with him. So. <laughs> um, and and we, we post the stuff to each other on Twitter a lot, too. So we, we've got a good good community between the two of us, and we're close together geographically, so oh, that helps. Great, yeah. that's cool. Um, so building in small batches, and then we moved to integrating continuously. Yes. And, and so... Can you build in small badges without integrating continuously, or what? What's the the difference there? That's a good question, and I think a lot of people believe you can, and I don't believe you can. I, I you know, the the thing, and Scrum says this: you should have potentially shippable software at the end of each iteration. And potentially shippable software means that software, the software is done and tested. And in order to do that, we can't just say at the end of an iteration, oh, yeah, we developers, we're done with it, now pass it on to QA, who take another two weeks or, or whatever to, to validate it, or to throw it back at us and say, hey, you got to fix stuff. That's really not this kind of the spirit of Scrum. So to do what the Agile Manifesto says, which is to um, deliver valuable software continuously, we probably need a framework to do continuous integration. So I like... I like to think about done as meaningfully done and tested. And in order to do that, we really have to integrate the the whole quality assurance side into the development side. I, I, I have the deepest respect for QA people, but I think we put them in a horrible situation in a lot of traditional development environments because we say, okay, find the bugs, but it's already too late to do much about it. And there's a lot of throw it over the wall. Like, oh, that's QA's problem. And I'm yeah. like, just give yeah. it to QA. Uh, I actually once worked with a guy who said if his code compiled, he had done his job. 
<laughs> and it was it was a Java web project, and wow. we would open it like I would pull down his code and merge it into mine and when I would go to open it it I couldn't even start the server it was like, wow <laughs> what? well it compiled it's that, that's good. like saying that your that your code is or your, your your what you say is syntactically correct yes but it could be gibberish <laughs> yes I did not work there very long <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, so so you talked about Dunn, and I believe during your talk, if I remember correctly, I went to so many talks uh, that you gave three types of Dunn. <laughs> yes. And, and I thought they were fantastic. Mm. Let's start out with just, can you give us the name of each type of Dunn? <laughs> yes, they're very creative names. Yeah. The first one is called Dunn, <laughs> which is um, that it works, at least for the developer who wrote it on their machine. It compiles. It right? compiles. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, which is certainly not good enough. So there's a second definition of Dunn, which is Dun Dun, and Dun Dun means that it's integrated into the build. That it not only compiles, but it runs within the context of everything else. And the, one of the big reasons that we want to do this is that it brings us away from the lie that we tell ourselves. It, tell, it tells us the truth that our code actually really works in the context of the rest of the code in the system. And that's a huge leap. Maybe non-developers don't quite know that, but the worst bugs are always found during integration. And that's why that's why I was six months behind in my, you know, it, when I thought I was really just three months to go. Com- component integration? Like, like you develop something and I develop something and then we try to put it together? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Or even at the smallest level. The small components or large components, but as soon as we start to play within the system, that's when we find the worst bugs. And... That's the problem with traditional software development, the waterfall development environment, is that we put that painful integration step all the way to the end because we didn't like it. Uh, And by then, it's kind of too late. Right. Rather than do that, take that integration and do a little bit every day. Continually integrate. And that suddenly, incredibly painful experience becomes the source of all good information. It's it's really amazing because when when we talk about, when we start to build and integrate as we're going and you know myself and some of my colleagues they'll integrate several times a minute well maybe not integrate but they'll run their tests several times a minute you you, you talked about that yesterday uh arlo uh, yeah arlo belshi belshi yeah friend I, and a, and a I, hero of mine. <laughs> I, I know who he is i was i did not want to mispronounce his last name because i'm terrible with names but um yeah, I, what did I you was, say? Three three times a minute. When I look at his server three. logs, he he'll he'll run his tests three times a minute that, as he's building code. That's kind of amazing. And, yeah, and I, I me too. I just I have to hit get that there. green bar all the I time. I mean, I, I frequently have tests running that automatically run every time I save a file, uh-huh. but I'm not always committing and, and integrating with everybody else that often. Um, but getting to the point where I can make a commit three times a minute would just make me happy as can be. <laughs> there are even tools. I forget now the name because you know it's early in the morning. Um, but there are tools that that every time you type a key on their keyboard as you're developing, it will try to actually do a build. So you get to the end of the line, you hit the semicolon. It's compilable. It'll actually compile it, run all the tests. If the tests fail, uh, if they fail, they'll not do anything. But if they succeed, it'll promote it. And you can even set it up to <laughs> release it. So developers just type away, and suddenly, bam, their code goes out into I, the, the world. I I would be in love if I can work that way every day. <laughs> now, I'm sure several people are like, that's crazy, and that's so scary. But what happens is you build this level of confidence because you've proven to yourself that your tests are good. And when you understand how to write really good tests, which is discussed in the book as well, um, then then you have this huge level of confidence and, and, and that fear goes away of like, oh my God, it's not going to work or what happens, you know. And, and you realize that life becomes a lot more fun. Um, we live under an enormous amount of stress in, in our industry. I know you, the audience can't see me, but I don't have much hair on the top of my head. And uh, that's because of the first 15 years of my 30-year career as a developer. I did Waterfall. And it was painful and hard. And life is a lot better now that I, that I do Agile and I do extreme programming practices. I, I really think that that's the huge value of, of Agile. And if you look at the Agile Manifesto, every one of those people in the picture, every one of the original authors of the Agile Manifesto are developers. They're programmers. And they wrote the Agile Manifesto for programmers, you know? So 
I, I really want to give Agile back to programmers, people who write code, because it's a big part of uh, Agile software development, the software development side. Yeah, I, I think that, that giving it back is important, and it's part of why Dave Thomas, a few years ago, wrote his blog post about Agile's dead, and it was really about... It, it got taken away from what it originally was, yeah. was meant to be. And, yeah. and I think that getting back there is pretty important. Um, but back back to tests, I have I have seen people trying to get that confidence level in their tests um, to where mm. they can ship all the time. And frequently, I think they make the mistake of, well, if we just write a bunch of tests, like a lot of extra tests, uh, then, then it'll be more confident. And, and yeah. I think it's the wrong way to go. I agree I with you. Re- red and make sure it's red for the reason that you expect it to be red. Yes. Green, and then my most important step is refactor. Yes. Ma- make it make it pretty nice, maintainable code. Yes. And then and then check in and move on. Um, One of my other heroes, Misko Havery, who is the author of Angular, mm-hmm. among other things, he's amazingly brilliant. And uh, I like what he says. He says that developers always assume they know how to write a test. No one ever really taught him. And he says, and this is true in my experience as well, that he's met very few developers who know how to write a good test. Yeah, you can write a test, but writing a really good test. test. Good tests have to be unique. They have to be, as much as possible, implementation independent. Right. And that means that the code that it's testing has to be written in such a way, and its architecture has to be designed in such a way that it's fully testable. It puts you in a nice, loosely coupled state when you can get to that point. But yeah. I, I will say I spent a, a lot of years in, in test hell, uh, <laughs> and at the time I didn't always know it, but um, I, I grew over time. But I think the only reason that I grew is because I continue to do TDD all the time. And I was very relentless about it. Like, this is what I'm going to do. And so I made a lot of mistakes over and over until I saw what those pain points were. And I also had a lot of good teachers around me and developers that I ended up working with that, that helped move me along. Excellent. And we had a lot of excellent conversations. So yeah. I think that's part important part of XP, too, is um, I'm going to skip now just because of that. I think Actually, it's the next practice, I think, that you're talking about, which oh, is collaboration. Yes, it is. It <laughs> it's is practice the next four. <laughs> that's what I was going to skip. Um, Fantastic, but, but what kinds of things um, are you talking about when you collaborate? Is it just pairing, or there, there's more? There's there's other configurations as well, and you can pair in in twos or threes. If you get more than that, we can sometimes call it a mob. Uh, if we're working on on something that is a showstopper, we call it a swarm. You know, so these are just different terms that we use, but it's different ways of collaborating. And the thing that I think a lot of us assume. Just like a lot of developers assume they know how to write a good test, we kind of sometimes assume that we know how to collaborate in the optimal way, without any guidance, or we know how to pair. And pairing is actually, well, there's lots of different approaches to pairing, but there, each one of them is very kind of specific, and there's, it's easy to do it wrong. You know, um, and when I say wrong, I, I mean it. You know, at least there's we're at this level that there's no such thing as right and wrong. It's more like what's what's working for us well and what's not. And software development is there's a lot of gray area. Some mm-hmm. things that the right thing to do in one situation is the utter wrong thing to do in another. So we have to be careful and always look at it within context. Um, but for example, in pair programming, sometimes people think that it's taking turns at the computer. And that's not quite what I think pair programming is. But it's great because I get to check my email on my phone <laughs> while, yes. you, while you type. Yeah, yeah. But then <laughs> while, 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 while I type, but then while you're typing, I get bored. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what I really want to do is bring two people to work on the same problem together. And we don't have any problem thinking about this for, in, the, in the physical world. Okay. Um, for example, in the physical world... If you were to move, um, if you wanted to move your house, for example, uh, you, all, all the things in your house, and uh, you hired a moving company to do this, and one guy shows up, then you're like probably going to wonder how is he going to get that king size mattress down the stairs and out the you know and into the new house and stuff. I mean, we would call that a two person job for what, sure. Right? What's that company called? Two guys in a truck. Yeah, that's the reason why it's not one guy in a truck. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> but intellectual problems can be just as unwieldy. And we, when we take two minds to work on a very unwieldy intellectual problem, it can help enormously. So having 
having resources, having having a person that you can bounce ideas off of can be really, really valuable. Especially when you're learning new practices, because it's almost self-policing. It's when you're doing, for example, test first development. I think it's a very natural way of thinking about doing development. But when we first try it, it's incredibly unnatural. And frustrating. It feels weird. <laughs> I mean, I, I can relate to this experience myself when I first did it and almost everyone I, I know who first tries it feels like, wow, this is strange. And that's because we weren't, we didn't really have that orientation. Once you get used to it, then doing software development the other way is strange. For me, without writing a test is strange. Yeah, I, I almost can't do it anymore really, without you too? a test. Uh, Isn't it amazing? In, in, in the very, very small, I can, but I get very frustrated quickly without writing a test. My test is really the embodiment for me of what is it that I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I would not really sit down at a keyboard and just type random characters. I would sit down at a keyboard and, and write some code that does something. So having it delineated what exactly my goal is, is really helpful. It's the, the sequence is ready, aim, fire, not fire, aim, ready. Yeah. Right? So the idea of getting ready and, and, and sort of figuring out what where you're aiming by writing your test first and then implementing that test makes total sense once you're familiar with it. Right. So I, I always want to not confuse lack of familiarity with with something that is like incorrect or wrong. It's not wrong. It's just that we're not familiar with it. So to go back to the me on my cell phone and you being bored. Um, yesterday you had you had talked about uh, Luel and Falco's idea of strong pairing. Yes. Um, it. Which is fantastic. I, I do that a lot, but can you tell people what that is? Sure. And it just it was just two weeks ago that I've had this experience. Um, <clears throat> I was working with a team in rural Pennsylvania, uh, and this is an amazing team. These guys are so sharp. It was it was great to. You never know when you're walking into a group, and I, I love working with all teams, but I especially love working with really really advanced teams, and this team was really advanced. And they also got along really well together. But their manager said to me before I came, one of the things we really want you to help us with is pair programming because we're not making pairing work really well. And I was shocked when I got there because it's like, wow, these, this is the perfect group. And they were kind of saying what you were saying, like, well, one guy's typing, the other guy's checking his email. So I said, I want to try an experiment with you guys. I want to just give you one tiny little tweak to what you're doing. And it's expressed in, in something that a, a friend of mine, Llewellyn Falco, says, you know, how he defines strong style pairing. So just do this one thing this week, and let's see if you guys, if it'll fix the pairing issue. So what Llewellyn says is, in order for an idea to go from your head into the keyboard, uh, if, I'm sorry, from, from your head into the computer, it has to go through someone else's hands. And they went, oh... And they follow that, and they're pairing awesomely well now. Which is also the same kind of thing whenever you talk to Woody Zool about um, mob programming, is he says the person at the keyboard, they, they can't type anything without being told. Yes. Um, and and I think that that really does help keep people in there. And you, you discuss ping pong pairing, too, which is yes. another great way. Yeah, where one um, person writes the test, and the other person fulfills it, writes the next test, and then they yeah. passes the keyboard back for that person to fulfill it. There's many configurations for pairing. Right. Yeah. And and one thing that I like to do um, to build ideas is, is that works along with these is... Uh, like, I don't know what I call it, extreme switching, I don't know, um, is, is I like to switch pairs every hour on the hour, and whoever has been oh. there the longest has to leave. Oh, switch pairs as in, like, new team members. Yeah. That's great. Uh, in order to get more ideas in, and I found out that in, in that configuration that frequently teams hate me whenever I first, like, let's, let's do this, and I ask them to stick with it, so we go to the first retro, and they say, it sucks, I hate this, and I say, why? And they're like, well, I never know what's going on. I move in. We never get things done. It's I'm never on something when it's finished. And so I'm like, well, let's make the story smaller then. <laughs> and and I use it as a tool to drive out some other behaviors. But then frequently after a month or so of doing it, I'll tell them, all right, let's, you guys want to go back to pairing all day or sometimes a whole week people pair. And, and they'll say, no, but maybe... Maybe we'll go back to two hours, and they do that for a week, and they like, can we go back to an hour? Because now I don't know what's going on. 
and so when they're hair switching every hour, they they seem to know the whole product and they wow. know everything that's happening. And wow. at a certain point, you stop having to explain when somebody sits down what you're working on. They already know. Yes. So all they do is look at your tests or your last commit message, and then they're like, "All right, let's roll." And it, it's just fantastic. I I love it. I wish people would do that more. I. I I'll tell you a brief story. I was uh, teaching a, a class for a very large internet property. And um, they, I usually, I really like to do a little lecture, do a little lab, and have people experience. But they said they wanted just the lecture. So they had me come in for three days and do just the lecture part. And the, there was only like, <laughs> I don't know, it was a couple developers that showed up for the class. Because they didn't know. You know, most classes kind of, some classes suck. So yeah. I guess they thought that this was going to be a class that sucked. So there was, you know, some QA people there, but the, the, there was only a couple developers that showed up. Well, they loved it. They loved the class, and so they asked me to come back and do the lab portion where they're doing the programming side. And th- this time, tons of people showed up. <laughs> and only one person that was there from the previous, and this is the labs that build on the lecture. So they, none of them had any of the lecture except one person. So I was in a really strange situation, and that's what I did. I did pair rotations every 20 minutes with them. Fantastic. It was unbelievable. They just did so well. I, I was looking at everyone's code, and now I was watching these memes of knowledge just radiate out among these team members. It's really amazing that the knowledge propagates so quickly when you pair and you rotate pairs. Right. And, and I, I tried to, I've tried to graph that before. <laughs> and, and show people through, like, saying, well, if you have a piece of knowledge that you transfer every hour and you work with somebody for eight hours and and how everybody needs to know this one thing and how long does that take to get passed around a team of, like, eight. And if you do <laughs> pair switching every hour, it, it's huge. And then I said, well, and then you have the other side of the coin where you're actually teaching more than one thing in that hour. And both sides are learning. And and as you switch, you get more eyes on the code, even less. Like, pairing, I think, gets rid of a lot of need for code review. There's still a good idea to get one more set of eyes and before you just move it on. Um but that need for code review goes even further down yes. because a lot of times half the team has seen that piece of code at some stage of its development. Yeah, really and, true. And it also makes it so uh, that high, high bus factor because everybody on the team knows every part of the system at that point. So anybody can leave and you're good to go. Yes. So, so pairing is a great, <laughs> a great way for developers to learn from each other. And when developers get that, they get really excited about pairing. And it's also a great way for developers to really kind of stay focused because when you're sitting with another developer working on a project, you're very unlikely to be checking your email or looking at Facebook or, or whatever. Right. So managers, when they realize that they're getting a lot harder work out of their developers, they like it too. Yeah, I, I, I often say that pairing keeps me out of what I call the wiki hole, <laughs> which is if I end up on Wikipedia for any reason, I have to click every blue link, and then I have to click every blue link Ooh. and every blue link link until I just force myself to quit because I, I I love knowledge and so I just keep reading. Wow. Um, so it keeps me out of that. It's a good place to be. Cool. Um, so the next thing was create clean code. Yes. And, and uh, you know, it, it's a little bit to, to Uncle Bob's book. Mm-hmm. You can nod to it. But uh, it, it's an acronym, right? Yes. And, and what, what does that mean? So it's, it's a nod to not only Uncle Bob's book, but the Clean Code Talks, which is one of the Google Tech Talks by Ms. Gohavery. Mm-hmm. And even though it was recorded a while ago, I really highly recommend it. They're really, really valuable. And just Misko, like I say, is really brilliant. He's got some great ideas. And he's a really articulate human being, so I, I really love his videos. Uh, I have not seen those videos often. Yeah, it's, yeah, do check them out. Um, so clean is also, I'm a developer, so I overload terms. So <laughs> I had to take a term that was already used. And uh, it's an acronym for the five key code qualities that are, I think, fundamental in all software development. I, I really, there's there's so many principles in software development that I think developers can benefit from. And I, I could easily have written a thousand pages on the subject. And I only had enough room for, to write one little chapter. So... I was thinking, how do I express this? And I came back to these five code qualities because I believe that they are even more fundamental than principles like the solid principles and, and, and all because they underlie all good software. Uh, so it, the five 
key qualities are. And by the way, I call them qualities, but they're quantitative. You can measure them, oh, which nice. is which is really cool. Sal- they're not subjective. Solid. I'm often trying to explain to somebody why their code <laughs> isn't single responsibility. For instance, it even gets hard at some levels. Yes. Yes. So um, the first, the first, the C. Your entity, your object is about one thing, or your method is about one thing. It does follow the single responsibility principle, mm-hmm. as Josh Krajewski likes to say. It, um, it, there's, it has one reason to exist, and therefore one reason to change. And um, I think this is one of the things that, when we don't follow this this idea of making all of our code cohesive, it can easily distort our domain model. So our domain model is the model of objects. It's the picture of the objects and how they relate to each other. And they should reflect what we're actually doing, what we're, what our, what the context is that we're building. So that you can look at the domain model either as a developer or a subject matter expert and go, oh, yeah, this is sort of how we would lay out our, our system. You know, It should be kind of intuitive and understandable. And as soon as we start to say, oh, I just have this little functionality. I don't need to make a whole other object to do that. You know, you know, it, there's this overhead when you create an object. It's, what is it, eight whole keystrokes that you have to type? Yeah. C-L-A-S-S, space, uh, space, curly bracket, and curly bracket. Hey, eight characters. Ask people, how, how hard is it to make a file? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know, but My somehow we're, makes it super easy. <laughs> not, we're tempted not to do it for some reason. Right. But when we do that and we start to load in to existing objects, new behaviors that don't belong there, we wind up distorting the domain model. And it becomes very hard to understand what's going on. And it also starts to conflate multiple different concepts with each other so that they're coupled together. And when you want change, change one, it can affect the other, even though it shouldn't, and things like that. So cohesion is the first of the five code qualities. Mm-hmm. Loosely coupled is the second. Means is another way that we can um, uh, make it easier to uh, inject dependencies and make it easier to uh, test uh, because we can remove dependencies when things are loosely coupled or talking through abstractions. Uh, it just makes each entity much more testable. I, I believe that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, encapsulation. And my definition of encapsulation, that's the E of clean, mm-hmm. uh, is hiding how we do something and only presenting what we're doing. So when we're presenting what we're doing, we're talking about what it is, but we're hiding those impl- implementation details. And that gives developers the freedom to change those details later without it affecting other parts of the system. So so you, you probably wouldn't have a method that asks for... It wouldn't have the word hash in it, or or um, right. a name of a variable saying hash, because then then sure, that binds it to its one particular detail. data structure. Right. right, right. Talk about what you want to get out of it, rather than how you're doing it. Right. Yeah. The, I, it's a ideas. mental shift. It's a really important shift. And it's something that is not so easy to do, but it is our specialty as software developers. It's kind of like our prime directive, which is to straddle between the how and the what. We get to go into how things are, but we got to hide that from the rest of the world and only present what. I, I, I like that way of looking at it, the how and the what. Yeah. Um, and, and I see often the how getting pushed out to the world. and so You know, it can happen very subtle ways, too. Like you said, even like just mentioning the name hash in a, in a method name, and suddenly you're bound to that. You know? And, and it, it makes people think in a certain way because yeah. of that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, I think that you know, that's the, what, the reason why some dynamic languages are really popular is because they can get you away from that, or, or interfaces in, in Java is because they get you away from the actual weeds of how it works, and they get you to what I'm after. Yes. Yes. Uh, a. A in clean. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, a is a, is a code quality that I don't hear a lot of people talk about very much, but I think it's still very, very, very valuable. It's called assertiveness. And assertiveness is really, we want to make sure that the behavior that consumes state is with the state. So we want to make sure that objects are in charge of themselves, in charge of their own state, in charge of their own responsibilities. And one of the things that we tend to sometimes do is spread responsibilities out among multiple entities. 
makes it very difficult to understand who is really in charge, and it makes it also hard to read what the process is that we're doing because it's spread out among multiple different objects. So uh, assertiveness really is taking state and object, and, uh, state and, and and behavior, and putting them together. And it's just a matter of again helping us build that domain model out so it's really clear. A lot of times we can ferret out missing objects from the domain model by just looking at assertiveness. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a, I didn't think of it that way, but, but yeah. Um, when, when I was thinking of assertiveness, I was thinking of situations where I see um, if foo.predicate, uh, then foo.something else, else foo.something else, outside of the foo class, instead uh-huh. of just telling it, hey, go do this for me. And I, I thought of tell, don't ask. Yes. You know, whenever yes. you said assertiveness. Yes. I guess that's maybe a way to recognize some assertiveness issues, Yeah, it's not the full picture. Yeah, but it's a piece that I hadn't really thought much about. Uh, we're doing a podcast at the moment. All right. Um, I, I don't know. I think we, we got past that. We got interrupted there. It's, it's okay. <laughs> uh, so the N in clean code. Yeah, uh, the N in clean means non-redundant. And... Uh, XP uses the term duplication. I think that redundancy is clearer to me because it includes areas that are not just copies of code. Um, If we're trying to do the same thing in multiple places, I consider it redundant. Even if the code is unique in both places, even if it's different code, if we're we're trying to accomplish the same thing, then it's redundant. And there's subtle forms of redundancy. So so the same... um I'm trying to trying to get an example. It's not not dryness. That would be duplication. Often is what people look at as dryness. Well, dryness is part of it. Don't repeat yourself, and yeah. don't repeat yourself in, in different ways, right? Right. So it's not it's not just the, the same code form. looks exactly the same. Right. So if I'm uh, sorting a, a list, it's an, it's an easy example, uh-huh. and I write two different sorts not because I'm looking for a performance in a certain area or anything like that, but just because I wasn't thinking that I already had this. Oh, Even though I might do it differently, it's still not... Um, sorry, I just blanked out. Non, it's non-redundant. It's non-redundant. It's still, yeah, it yeah. still is redundant. Yes, at that yes, okay. yes, yes. Uh, okay, well, we've touched on write test first. I don't know that we... Do you have anything else to... Oh, I actually have a lot to say about it in the book, but... um... (laughs) That's fine, because we talked about it here. Yes. Um, When we talked about collaboration, we we ended up into there. Yes, yes, Um, yes. Uh, But maybe the next practice, which relates to to it, which is how I think about writing the test first, is is specify behaviors with tests. And you you alluded to this earlier, that that people write too many tests, and they write implementation-dependent tests. Mm -hmm. And... I found that the guidance of test until board, which is kind of the conventional wisdom in the area, is just not good enough because we have different thresholds for boredom. So the way we can achieve consensus between the test that you think we need to write and the test that I think we need to write is to understand how to articulate any behavior through tests. So I, I think of my tests as a way of defining the behavior of my system, of my code that I'm going to write. So... When we see that perspective, and we could we could achieve this in just a couple of days. We could we could look at a whole bunch of different kinds of problems and say, not how are we going to code it, but how are we going to what tests do we need to verify it? And we can achieve total we could achieve total consensus on that. And when we do, it gives us a great amount of power, you know, because then we're really on the same page. Even if our implementations are different, we know those points that we want to con- connect on, which I think is very, very powerful and useful. I, I, f- I found a good way to get there is, is really make sure that you have that red step first. Yes. Because uh, I see a lot of tests get written where it's already green whenever they write it. And, yes. and, I, and I often ask, uh, when I'm working with somebody and I see that, I say, so, so where did that test get us? Why, why did we write that? Did it further the project along? Uh, and then if they say, well, it, nowhere, then I'm like, okay, well, let's remove yes. it and, and try that again. Um, yeah. And, and so... I spend a lot of time removing tests. <laughs> yes. Well, and that's where you get that the behavior. And and I do understand that tests sometimes are communication. And so I've, I've had people say, oh, well, I want this case in there or I want this in there because I think it helps communicate it better. And sure. Then, and then I often say, well... 
can we drop the other one then? <laughs> also test this. Like why? And and at least that gets a conversation going. It makes for a great pairing session. Yes. Um, whenever you have those conversations, even if we end up keeping all the tests, I love having that conversation. So since we're talking about communication, I want to know one. I want to know from you. What are your thoughts about comments in code? Uh, <laughs> Oh, have you, you've not listened to the podcast. I, I hate comments and code yeah. most of the time. Um, yeah. Actually, one of the other um, hosts of the podcast, we were working on a project together at one point, and he wanted to put a comment in the code. <laughs> and I said, why don't we just alias this method name to what your comment is? Yes. Or or make, make this call one that explains that. And um, we, I, I should have just let him put the comment in. I did. We had like a forty-five minute argument. At which time, someone else on the team said, "Like, they came over and they're like, I agree with you.' I, oh, I, nobody can hear me. They, they like whispered, I, I agree with you.' Yes, yeah. but it's time. Just let them put it in. It's not a big deal. And so I was like, fine. And yes, I sat yeah. down and I started to write like a four paragraph comment that it really should have been one sentence about exactly every detail of, of what this meant. But I think that's where you get into intention revealing code. Yes. Is that if, if, you, if you can't communicate it through the code, maybe your abstraction is wrong. Or maybe you just need to sit back and think. And I think so many times in our career field, people measure their worth by how much they type and not by how much they think. Yeah. And a lot of times, um, you need to take a step back. I actually have a friend who writes Haskell full time for a living, um, in Portland and, uh, other people that I've talked to that have Haskell have said the same kind of things that they write a whole lot less code and think a whole lot more and they get about the same amount accomplished. Yes. Um, yes. And, but and, and I always point out that it's, that it's because Haskell is so entirely difficult that, <laughs> that they have to think that much, but, uh, yes, I really yes. like Haskell. It, it's just, it drives my head crazy sometimes. Well, and, and I'm sure a lot of your, um, your listeners would agree. And I'm not down on all comments. I think why comments can be very useful, why we're doing something. But what comments, what we're doing, should be expressed by the code. So I feel like the why comments belong in a commit message. And, <laughs> and, and the reason why they belong in a commit message is because the why lives with the code that's written at the time that it's written. And as that code changes, frequently the comments above don't actually change. Um, and so the why has changed. And so I, I try to encourage people more often, whenever you look at some code and you're confused, read the commit messages for every line in that piece of code. And, um, yes. and sometimes those commit messages Great. say... <laughs> uh, I, I'm also not a big fan of one-line commit messages. Things like like get have the the dash m flag where you can put the commit. I hate that. I just wish it wasn't there. Mm. I wish it always opened up an editor. Um, but I've also seen teams try to make comment link requirements um, before the build will even accept the commit, and then you get like garble just people mashing the keyboard no words actually just, <laughs> just to meet that requirement wow, wow. Um, yeah so yeah. so i give people that sometimes you get frustrated you're not going to have a great commit message but if you want a why put it in the commit because cool. when that why changes and that code changes there's a new why that gets replaced yeah uh, that's great. i've actually this isn't a why thing but it is a, a comment thing is i've seen code that said uh, this variable is set to 12 because and then the variable was called like it was it was a, a constant so somebody decided that they needed to pull out their magic number but they didn't have a good name for the constant so the constant was called five very <laughs> intention revealing uh-huh. and, and and or might have been four I don't know it was different than the comment above and then it was set equal to like 25 or something <laughs> isn't that great and, and I showed it to people and I asked them and what what it was set to. Most people thought that the name of the variable was what it was set to. With They didn't even really read the whole thing. There were a few people who read the first part of the comment and stopped. 
and didn't actually look at the code. And I didn't have anybody actually give me the right answer wow. of what it was when yeah. I asked on this team. And then uh, yeah. it, it, I was like, see? The no comments. So no comments. It's so true. And the reason I bring this up is that I was attacked recently by a manager who said that I go around telling people to write uncommented code. And I'm like, no, comments are really like the worst form of communication. And it's far better to think about better forms of communication. Like you said, make your names that you're using intention revealing. So you don't need a comment that it says what the code is doing in the first right. place. You know? And, <laughs> so. and, and whys are often short lived. So put it in your commit message. Because that's that's a it lives as long as it needs to. And, and even though I was kind of depressed by this, because I was actually publicly attacked, um, I started to, you know, put it on Twitter, and I started to write blog posts about this, and actually there's, you know, <laughs> a lot of people who agree, a lot of developers who agree, so it became a good talking point for me. Well, I, I um, in college, had had a professor that wanted us to comment, and I think that there, there's a lot of that, is, yes. is especially fresh out of college, there's a lot of professors that want you to comment, and I would say that's because frequently... They're not. If you're a professor at a college and you're doing research software, you're frequently not trained to write something that's maintained over a long period of time, and you're reading a lot of code of people who have have not been taught intention revealing code. So instead, you tell them to comment because it's probably easier to teach them just to add a comment in. Um, and the only time that I've seen effective comments were class level comments, like up above the class, mm-hmm. um, that that told a little bit about what it. The, the intention of the entire class was. Uh, yes. and, and I often say, well, you should read all the method names and the class name and, and end up at the same point. Yes. Um, so even that, but I, I find that those top level comments change, need to change less. Because half the time people don't change the comments once they're there. Yeah, that's the other uh, problem with comments. <laughs> but but they, since they're at that top level and they're usually a higher level comment, they, they need to change frequently a lot less. So they, they're, they're less lies. I look at comments as lies. Yeah, yeah. I do too. That's what I call them. <laughs> so uh, should we do the last two? Yeah, yeah. Implement design last. Implement the design last. So um, I spent a lot... I, I kind of feel like a big part of my career is about thinking about the software development process itself. I spent a lot of time thinking about it. I really can't come up with a more inefficient way of building software than the way most of us currently build software. And I've really tried. Um, I can certainly come up with more efficiencies, but making it less efficient is really hard because we're really inefficient. And traditionally, and I think in manufactured goods or physical things, it makes sense that you, you create it first and then you test it, right? Um, so writing the test first is weird for some people, but it turns out that it's really not a test. It's more a hypothesis, you might say, or a specification, which you would do first. <clears throat> I think a lot of times, and, and we think about doing design up front rather than in, at the end, but a lot of times it's more effective and efficient to do not all of our design, but a lot of our implementation of our design after we already have our code working and under test because now we're refactoring our code and repackaging it in more maintainable ways under safety because our tests are there to give us safety. And if we write good tests, then our tests don't need to change when we refactor our code. So we have all that benefit of it and not this big burden of having to change the test itself. It, it, makes, it makes development not only faster, but it makes us, as we're building, more confident because it's just easier and more straightforward to do it that way. And, and so you're not necessarily talking about like picking the color blue on the front end of your of your web application. No. Um, this is more of a... I mean, it, it could be design of usage, right? Like on the front end, you move buttons around and your test should still be good. But um, mm-hmm. you're talking about this, the back-end software, object-oriented design, functional sure. programming design, sure. those kind you're, of things. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Um, and then the f- last final practice is uh, refactor legacy code. And the reason that I've taken this idea of legacy code and put it all the way to the end of the book is that we have to really understand what good code looks like before we can talk about changing bad code into good code. 
we have to know what our target is. So uh, I spent most of the book talking about what good code looks like and how to build good code. And then those same tools and techniques, those intellectual tools that we're talking about, can be applied to our existing code and we're cleaning up our legacy code. So we, once we get through, get to that point, we already have those tools available to us. And it's just a matter of applying it to our existing code rather than applying it to new code. It, I don't know that there's much to say on that. I, I, the, you, you said bad code in there. And, and I, I think that I often have to tell people when I say this legacy code or this bad code, it's, it's not a reflection on you as a developer. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm not saying that you're a horrible person. We all do the best we can with the information we have. Yes. And, and I, I'm saying that yesterday, I, I frequently say yesterday me is an idiot. <laughs> and when I don't think yesterday me was an idiot and I, I didn't learn something new, then I'm not happy in my career. <laughs> then for me, yeah, for yeah. me, today's me, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes... Um, uh, yesterday me catches up to today me and ten, ten minutes ago me was an idiot um, but so I, I try to kind of put that on me a little bit when I when I am talking to other developers is that look yesterday me wrote bad code this code is is not good code and and, and you need to separate yourself from that so I think that working with legacy code even your own code can be legacy oh absolutely and, and so it's okay to let it go <laughs> yes. and to make change. Yes, yes, yes. I think that's really And important. it means that we're always growing. If, if I don't see myself, if I don't, if I don't look back at the code I wrote two years ago and go, oh my God, that's horrible. Who wrote that? Oh my God, it was me. Then I don't feel like I'm growing, you know? <laughs> yeah. I actually had once somebody told me that they had worked on a project that I had worked on a couple of years before and they said, we, we haven't really had to change anything on it. And I was like, well, what is wrong with you? <laughs> uh, um, I was really surprised. And they just said that they hadn't really had any bugs. So they hadn't looked into it. Um, and then one guy, after he looked into it, was like, oh, I need to rewrite this. <laughs> uh-huh. yes, but, yes. uh, well, thank you, David. I took a whole lot more of your time than I intended to. Oh, today. it was great fun. Thank uh, you. I want to just mention, uh, if I can plug the book. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's the great. book, which because we've been talking about it, I just yeah. want to make sure that we have the title. It's called Beyond Legacy Code. Code, mm-hmm. Nine Practices to Extend the Life and Value of Your Software. Um, you can get it from either my publisher, Pragmatic Bookshelf, or on Amazon. If you go to beyondlegacycode.com, it'll redirect you to Amazon, and you can you know, uh, see a video and read more about it or, or pick it up. Uh, I wrote it, uh, even though I'm talking about technical practices, in common sense terms. I wrote it so that you can give it to your manager or your executive or the CEO of the company, and they can understand the reasoning behind these practices, because that's really where the gap, I think, is. And even us developers sometimes could benefit from learning a little bit more about the why behind the practices, and that's what I stress. There is only one code example, so it's not like a deep technical book. Although I'm talking about deep technical concepts, I really want to boil it down to common sense so that management and developers can get on the same page about them. And I think that's the real benefit of the book. And I've seen uh, it, it go to a company and it go up the chain and down the chain, and suddenly everybody's in code. It just totally connected and understands the value of these practices. It seems to help. That's that's fantastic. And even if you can't get your manager to read it, it can give you some talking points as a developer that and that you Absolutely. can say here's why here's why I think we should do this. I call it ammo. It yeah. gives you tons of ammo Perfect. for for doing these technical practices when appropriate. And then uh, I also want to just mention that my website, if you want to get a hold of me or uh, and, or if you have questions or anything, I'm happy to, to talk. I love talking with people. Uh, is to be agile.com T O B E like to be or not to be uh-huh. agile.com uh, and people can get a hold of me there. And uh, and I'm happy to talk with you. And and Twitter was also at to be agile. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I tweet about this stuff all the time. Fantastic. Well, yeah. thank you for taking your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank and uh, enjoy the rest of your conference and have a safe trip home. Thanks so much, Amy. All right. Have a good day. Bye bye. This Agile Life is brought to you by a community of agile developers and coaches aspiring to spread the word about this groundbreaking approach to software development. Join us at thisagilelife.com forward slash community.